Today we're reading some more malicious compliance and it's going to be so fun. I don't just have a compilation today, there's also a brand new episode at the beginning of this. So yeah, it's definitely going to be a fun video and I hope you guys are excited. These stories are so addictive and I can't wait to get into this. So yeah, let's do just that. Enjoy guys. My boss can't hire with crappy wages, so demotes me instead. Okay, but it'll cost you a million pounds. A few years ago, I worked at a janky two-bit company. The boss thought he was Billy Big Bollocks and God's gift at the same time. He had such a big head, I'm surprised he could get through doorways. He used to drink beer at his desk for lunch and would often arrive at work late. He was also an insufferable muscle bro and walked around as if carrying rolls of carpet under each arm. Prick. A few months into my time there, the company starts winning large orders. So he asked me to set up a small-scale production line to increase capacity and tells me the new hire will be situated there. I design it, set it up, test it all works and I'm feeling a sense of pride with what I've accomplished. It worked like a dream. I was confident it would work really well for the new hire. Because I'm an engineer by trade, everything was perfect and only I knew how to fix the broken stuff. Nobody else asked how it worked before making some very detrimental decisions. A while later there was an issue. He couldn't hire anybody willing to accept such a crappy wage and boring work. So Billy Big Bollocks had a bright idea to demote me and make me governor of my creation. No way, not for 9,000 less. I am immediately started job hunting and I told him if that's your final offer, regard tomorrow as my final day, he panics that he's committed the company to a million pound order due for shipping in three days time. During his alcohol fueled panic, he tells me to write up highly detailed technical manuals and processes for my replacement. Production line included some precise handwork. Piss off, I can't do that in one day. He also didn't specify what they should contain and considering I had no help from him with this project, just complaints, I thought screw it. So sure, he got his manuals. I created word documents with convincing time titles like technical manual product version 2.0 and how to do this precise task. Inside the documents were for example, the surprised Pikachu face and bubbles from Trailer Park Boys looking lost. Then below just one line of text reading, this manual contains all the information I could find or was given. The file sizes would also indicate a lot of text was contained within thanks to the images. Therefore at face value they did look legitimate. I saved them to my laptop in an equally legitimate looking folder that afternoon. Early the next morning I came to work to collect my belongings and do some handovers and I found the laptop had vanished. I said my goodbyes to my colleagues and I looked over to see him looking incensed with a beer in hand. He was so angry he didn't even look up from his desk. A friend told me later the company missed the production deadline despite him working 12 hour days to catch up. Apparently the client was extremely angry. Don't screw over good people, prick. I don't understand why somebody like that is the boss. Like how did that even happen? Obviously they can't run something like this. That's so wild that they're the boss. The top comment says this system was designed and implemented by a higher pay grade engineer. As I'm just just a low paid production line worker. I'm unable to produce technical manuals for the widget maker thingy. Regards, OP. Yeah, good on you for getting out of there, OP. The next one is called Entitled Mother Tells My Mum to Handle Her Kids. I posted this in Entitled Parents, but somebody commented that it counted as malicious compliance too. So I'm posting it here too. My 17 female mum, 41 female, took me out to get makeup the other day for a friend whose birthday's coming up. We entered the store and all is going really well. I was checking out concealers while my mum was on the other side of the shop looking through various shades of lipstick. Enter entitled mother, late 20s female, with her devil spawn. I say devil spawn because her kids were misbehaving wildly and she wouldn't even bother once to tell them to stop or something. Not even a minor rebuke. I say devil spawn because that about sums up these two kids. They were running wild around the shop, throwing testers around and being a general nuisance. My mum stepped in when the kids started poking their slimy little fingers into the lipstick testers. I get it, they're just testers, but ill. People are likely going to use those to decide whether they like the shade or not. And God knows where those fingers have been. Like one of them legitimately was picking his nose minutes ago. My mum, having four kids of her own, looked around to find their parent. Entitled mother was the only one in the shop besides us. My mum called out to her and this is how the conversation went. Mum, excuse me, are these kids yours? I know, very obvious, but my mum is a very polite person, so it's not odd to me. Entitled mum, yeah. My mum, can you please tell them to stop touching the testers? They're not toys. Entitled mum, if it's such a problem, why don't you handle them? Oh boy, my mum left the shop for a few minutes and signaled me to not follow her. She came back with two buff security guards in tow. The kids were still poking their fingers in the testers. The security guards walked up to the kids and in the deepest baritone ever, one asked, excuse me, what are you doing? The kids looked terrified and cued the waterworks. The entitled mum immediately stormed over and began reprimanding the guards for scaring her poor widow angels. She then saw my mum nearby. Entitled mum, you did this. At this point she was practically hissing like a cat. How dare you teach me how to parent? Mum in an 
Ingenieur Monotone. You told me to handle them, hence I handled them. She screamed more obscenities at my mum, the guards, and anything around, really. But the guards weren't having it, and they told her to leave. She created quite a scene, but thank everything that's holy. She left. My mum had quite the story to tell at dinner. A rather comedic encounter with an entitled parent. Well, she told your mum to handle the kids, and your mum did. Like, come on, why are you so upset? I did what you said. But yeah, the fact that their kids were doing this, and they weren't going to do anything about it, to the point that they say to your mum to do something about it. That is such awful parenting. But yeah, would have been entertaining for you, OP. The next one is called Boomer Got Malicious Compliance on Me. Warning, this is Holism AF. This is also a throwaway account. Anybody who knows me will be able to ID me from this. I have a hobby that I turned into a small business. It's not a lot of money, but it's kind of nice and it's a thing that I enjoy doing. Over the last five years or so, I've developed a reputation as a man of my word and somebody who provides a great product at a fair price. I live in an area that has a lot of vacation homes around a lake. These homes are owned by people who have 500k or more to spend on having a place on the lake just to go to on the weekends during the summer. Mary and Steve are two of these people. Mary and Steve own a couple of businesses. They're known for treating people fairly. Even people that they're fired will tend to acknowledge that they had it coming. Mary stopped by my shop back in September. She wanted to hire me to do some work for them for Steve's Christmas gift. I could do what she wanted me to do. I gave her a price of 5500 She agreed instantly. We shook hands and I went to work. I got it finished up December 20th, just in time. I had to take a few days off from my regular job to make it happen. Mary was thrilled at the result. She went to get me a check and she wanted to write it out for 11000 double what we agreed on. I declined telling her that 5500 was what we agreed to and that's all I was going to take. December 26 rolls around and Steve shows up thanking me for his Christmas gift, gushing over the craftsmanship and then complains that I wouldn't take the bonus money that I was offered. I explained to him, Mary and I agreed on the price and we shook hands on it. A deal is a deal. Steve says to me, well, at least let me buy you and your girlfriend dinner 21 times. He had a big crap eating grin on his face. I should have known he was up to something. I thought about it, thinking local restaurants and agreed. Then he said, my choice, any place I choose, all on my dime. In hindsight, this should have clued me in on the fact that he had something up his sleeve. I smiled and laughed and I said, okay. The entire month of January went by and I didn't hear anything from Steve and Mary, which is fine. We're not exactly in the same social circles. At the end of January, all of a sudden, my girlfriend just got super happy, like giddy. I knew she had a secret she was keeping from me, but I wasn't sure what. She told me to pack my bags for Valentine's Day and that we'd be gone for 10 days and to bring my passport. We would leave on the 10th of February, 19 days ago. We got to the airport and who would you guess was there? Steve and Mary. I was shocked as hell. Steve said that he had a debt to pay and he owed us 21 meals at a time and place of his choosing. He chose Rome over Valentine's Day. I tried to say no. He threw my words back in my face. A deal's a deal. The four of us spent the next week in Rome, Italy. Steve and Mary paid for our flights, hotel room and 21 meals. All of our tools and transport was on us. We got back home on the 22nd of February. We had a great time. Wow, that's so cute. What absolute legends. I feel like I owe you dinner. In Italy, 21 different times. That's so awesome, OP. Imagine a customer being so happy that they send you to Italy. That's a dream come true. The next one is called, you want me to move seats? Okay. I, 21 female, was born with a malformation of my inner ear. On top of making my right ear stick out like an elephant, it also causes me to have balancing issues. To prevent me from toppling over, I use a cane for support and balance. Yesterday, I was taking a train back to my university city. I always get the closest seats to the door since if the train starts and I'm standing. The chances of me losing my balance and falling over are high. Unfortunately, speaking from experience, these seats usually have an indication of priority for people with moving impairments and this train was no different. I got on and I sat down with my headphones in. Not a minute goes by when I'm startled by a tap on my shoulder. I pulled my headphones out and I looked up to see an older looking man. The first thing he said was, you need to move while pointing to the priority seating sign. I was flustered and I was only able to stutter, but, but I do, before he went away mumbling about not having time for this. I thought that'd be the end of it. I was wrong. A minute later, the man came back with a train attendant. He just pointed at me going, tell her to give me the seat. I have priority and some other ramblings I don't remember. The attendant wasn't mean or anything. She just said, ma'am, this is priority seating. Would you please give your seat to this gentleman? I wasn't even trying to do a cue malicious compliance moment. I'm just terrified of confrontation and I'd rather risk wobbling away to another seat, even though the train was already moving. I have one of those metallic folding canes, so I unfolded it and I leaned on it to get up. Before I can even leave, the attendant just starts waving me to sit back down. Oh no, no, it's okay, ma'am. Just stay in your seat. The old man didn't say anything. He just looked annoyed like he didn't understand why he couldn't have my seat. The attendant led him away to find you another seat while the guy grumbled something. I just sat there and enjoyed my faceplant free train ride while drawing and listening to music. I never saw the old guy again, but the attendant smiled at me whenever she passed by. Thank you for reading. Oh, yay, that's so 
so good, OP. Shout out to the attendant. And yeah, I'm glad you had a good trip. Not as in like, <laughs> I didn't mean to say that. Not a trip as in falling over, but a good train trip. Yeah, that's awesome. The next one is called My Husband Cleaned the Work Bathroom. My husband is a very skilled outdoor tech for a big communication corporation. He's been there 34 years. He was doing some online safety training in office. A 20-something inside engineer, Skippy, told him to go mop the bathroom floor. My husband refused, stating not covered under his job title. Skippy begged to differ, said the floor was muddy from the outside pig's boots, and he is management, so he can order people to do anything. Not true, of course. Hubby got an idea, stated, okay, he would go do it. He went to the mechanic area and grabbed the power washer, put in lots of cleaner and hosed the bathroom down, ceiling to floor, including the paper towel, toilet paper, magazines, and the crappy chair they stored in there. There is a floor drain as it's in the garage area. Skippy uses this bathroom as it's the closest one to his office. Husband went back to his online courses. Skippy went to the restroom and came howling at my husband about soap being everywhere and how it was a huge mess, blah, blah, blah. My husband replied, anything worth doing is worth doing, right? If it's not cleaned enough, he'd be happy to put degreaser into the power washer and clean it again. Skippy had to answer to his second level and is now refusing to speak to my husband. Wow, that's so funny. <laughs> yeah, like the top comment says, and he's now refusing to speak to my husband. That's what we call a solid win. Yeah, that's not a bad thing. Oh no, you're not gonna talk to me anymore? Yay! <laughs> the next one is called Boss Demands Overtime Pay for Zero Work. Okay, so this happened a while back, but the memory still brings a smirk to my face whenever I think about it. I used to work for a company where the boss had this habit of demanding that we stay late, even when there was absolutely no work left to be done. It was one of those toxic environments where your productivity was measured by the hours you spent at your desk, rather than the actual output of your work. One day after wrapping up all of my tasks well before the end of the day, the boss came over and told me that I needed to stay late because that's just how things are done around here. Mind you, there was literally nothing left for me to do. Now, instead of arguing or trying to reason with him, I decided to play along with his ridiculous demand for overtime pay. I nodded, grabbed a book I'd been meaning to read, and settled back into my chair. For the next two hours, I sat at my desk flipping through pages, occasionally pretending to jot down notes, and looking as busy as possible. At the end of those two hours, my boss came to check on me, expecting to see me toiling away at some imaginary task. Instead, he found me reading a novel. He looked puzzled and asked, what are you doing? With a straight face, I replied, well, you asked me to stay late, so I figured I might as well put in some overtime. This book has been on my reading list for a while. Needless to say, my boss was speechless. He couldn't really argue with me since he'd asked me to stay late, and I was technically still on the clock. From that day forward, he never asked me to stay late unless there was actual work to be done. Malicious compliance at its finest. Yeah, how frustrating. Why the hell would you stay late if there's nothing to do? I'm glad that they realized that doesn't make any sense. Well, like I'm assuming they realized it doesn't make any sense. Cause yeah, that's so stupid. But yeah, you did the right thing, OP. Oh, what's that? You're doing something stupid and there's nothing to be done. I'll read my book. The next one is called I Overdressed for Work. I-24 female work in a high-end store and we have a very specific dress code. No jeans unless it's black. No leggings, no skirts above the knee. No spaghetti straps, no low-cut shirts, etc. I wore a black tank top with a brown knitted turtleneck, black jeans, black shoes, and black socks. My hair was in a nice bun as well. I wore this many times before and I had no issues with it. Until the other day, I got pulled to the back by the ASM, assistant manager, and she told me that I need to dress better and look less homeless. Oh my god! The manager being right beside her said nothing and when I tried to ask what she meant, the manager told me to listen to her. That night, I went online and I found everything I needed. The next day, I went around all the local malls and shops until I couldn't shop anymore. I got a blue dress, $20, white gloves, $5, a fake pearl necklace and bracelet, $15, and I went to the drugstore to get bobby pins. I spent that night doing my hair until it was perfect. I ironed my dress, I cleaned and polished the pearls, and I practiced some light makeup. Everything was perfect and ready. I woke up at 5.30am to be at work by 9. I did my hair, my makeup, my nails, and I got dressed. I took one final look in the mirror, and I was smiling like there was no tomorrow. I walked into work to see my manager and assistant manager angry at me while I'm smiling. I got instantly pulled into the back and they yelled at me. All I had to say was, I don't look homeless now, do I? I walked out and customers only wanted to talk to me because I looked fancy. It was a good day. I didn't take any pictures of myself because I forgot lol. I was too excited, but for reference, look up beehive hair and Audrey Hepburn, the little black dress. Thank you. Yeah, like the top comment says, I wore this many times before and I had no issues with it until the other day. Nothing like finding out that the manager will not stick up for you. Not even to impose his authority over the assistant manager. No going above and beyond for them. Yeah, 100%. Good job, OP. I love how you handled this. And yeah, I feel like that's a good place to end the episode. Let's read something wholesome. I'm such an idiot. I can't believe I did that. Wait a second. I made a mistake and that's okay. I am not stupid. Yeah, how true is that? You can't beat yourself up for stuff like that.
like this. And yeah, the way that you talk to yourself about yourself really, really does matter. Don't forget to close all the tabs in your head too. Yeah, wow, the wholesome memes are good today. That one's by Hello Sunshine. There's no such thing as perfect. Huh? You're beautiful as you are, Courage. Even with your imperfections, you can do anything. Thank you, Bathtub Barracuda. Yeah, a million percent. Thank you, Bathtub Barracuda. Very beautiful and motivational wholesome memes today. A good place to end the episode. Thank you for watching, everybody. I hope you had a wonderful time. And if you did and you want to see more videos like this, make sure you like and subscribe. And the comment of the day today goes to Cats Over Brats. Vincy, we need you to stop by Insane People Facebook at some point. Thank you for the idea. I definitely will. I've been trying to think of something new I can make a video on. So yeah, thank you so much. I'll definitely check that out. And also, guys, if there is anything else you want me to check out, let me know down below in the comments. And thank you for the support. As always, make sure you look after yourself and make sure you have a beautiful, amazing rest of your day. And you know what I'm about to say because I say it every single day. Bye! You want to discipline me for being right? I got you. I work for a freight delivery company. I drive a semi truck and I usually go out with 10 to 15 deliveries a day. Our policy is that when you deliver to a residence, you have to take a picture with the work phone as an additional proof of delivery. That has morphed into now if the delivery receipt, DR, says residential, you have to take a picture of it, regardless if it's going to a business or a house. There are so many small details on a DR that can get missed, so this is an important detail. One day last week, I had a delivery for Laura Lopez, name Changed. It was being delivered to a construction company that Laura is an employee of. The DR does not say that it's residential. I make the delivery and I leave. No picture. The next morning, my BH of a supervisor says, I have a write-up for you. Puzzled, I ask her for what? For the Laura Lopez delivery yesterday. It was residential. I explained to her that it was at a business and the DR did not say residential. She wasn't having it. I also should mention that her and I butt heads often. And she's been trying to get rid of me for some time. I told her that we need to go talk to my manager about it. So we do and he sides with me because she has no ground to stand on. This infuriates her. I tell her that under no circumstances will this be an issue again. That day is when I start my malicious compliance. I take pictures with the work phone at every stop. What happens is when I hit depart on the work phone, it sends a pop up to her computer and the picture and she has to acknowledge it before she can do anything else on her computer. I crashed her computer three different times that day. At one stop, I took 20 pictures. I get a call from her telling me that I have to stop taking pictures. I politely tell her that I'm covering my ass and not going against policy. I'm giving you an order. I laugh and then I hang up. Sure as hell, she wrote me up for it. I don't even argue. I say that we need to take it up to my manager. I walk in and he says, what now? I tell him the story. He looks at her, takes the write up and rips it up. Are you seriously writing him up for overperforming? She had no words. And I still take a picture at every stop because I'm petty lol. Wow, that's so awesome. And also awesome the way that your manager was handling it. The top comment says, takes the write up and rips it up. Are you seriously writing him up for overperforming. Props to the boss for actually knowing that she's a pain. You're my new driving hero. Stay safe. Yeah, I get the feeling this isn't the first time they've been annoying about something. The next one is called You Want Me To Act My Wage. All right then. This was my first job a few years back. I was a working student at a startup as web dev. I was specialized in the field they deployed their software in, as well as the use technology. The first year was great. I learned a lot and though I had a contract for 20 hours, I worked at least 40. More than a few weeks were even 60. I identified myself with the company, with the product, with the people. Come another year down the road, people wanted to implement a feature. I raised concerns that it might be difficult to implement, given the software architecture at that point, and also probably useless because the metrics were a mess. The CEO told me to act your wage, and I thought to myself, all right, will do. I strictly committed to my 20 hours a week, didn't work a second longer. I updated my CV, got an interview and a new job, quit with a month of notice. The company leadership was horrified and had to take action I learnt later to hire a new web dev who could pick up from where I left off. They had to fire almost the whole sales department. My resignation caused them to lay off almost 30% of their workforce. By today, the company operates with 35% remaining employees. Edit. I should also mention that clients ran off because the support line was not manned 24 7 anymore, that bug fixes took way longer, and that new features were very faulty because I only implemented what was in the very badly described tickets. Edit number two. I think I need to clarify a few things. First of all, the location 
location of work was in Germany, so I had to follow German legislation. One month of notice because of the working student engagement. All hours got compensated. I made sure of it. It should also be noted that it was during the studies of my master's degree in computer science, so the work benefited my studies. Yeah, like the top comment says, 100% the way to do it when the workplace doesn't respect your expertise. How did the new job go? And OP said, rewarding, excellent team lead, excellent pay, very interesting project. Gotta love a happy ending. Good on you for getting out of there, OP. You're onto better things. They didn't deserve you. The next one is called What Professor Asked For, Professor Gets. I had a hand in this malicious compliance and it was rather nice. First, a little information. Back when I was working as a classroom technician for my local community college, after I graduated, the college had a need for a technical scribe for a blind student. They needed somebody who could not only provide direction of what the computer was showing on the screen, software that audibly gave cues on what you were doing, was unable to, but also had the technical skills to also know how to work the software that was being used. I fit in perfect and I was hired on to do technical interpreting for the student for the quarter. The professor assigned for the students to create a user interface that did some specific things. Well, the paper that he gave out had a general idea of what the student were to create. To help, but not overly help, I designed the general GUI, graphical user interface, and then let the student do the brunt of the work that Dragon functioned for. And I filled in the gaps by verbally cueing him on where he was and what to do next, because Dragon wasn't giving any cues. Student then turned in the assignment. Professor asked us to come into his office the next day, and he says that he knows that I did the GUI part, and it was the student's responsibility to do their own interpretation of what he handed out. I was about to explain, but the student grabbed my arm, politely apologised and said that he'll do as he was asked. We leave his office and I ask what's up? Can you edit the settings on those laser printers in the computer lab to print a page of nothing but black? I said sure. So we do so, and after that black page was printed out, we went back to the professor's office. He said, well that was quick. The student handed over the paper, and the professor was really confused. Student then spoke up. You said for me to design a GUI based off of what you printed. This is what I saw, so I'm giving you my interpretation of the image that you printed for the class. Wow, that's incredible. At that moment, the professor had a light bulb go off in his head, realizing that he required a blind student to give their interpretation of an image that he printed for the class. He apologized, said the previous work will be counted, and for future assignments to proceed as we had been. He then said to the student, well played. Wow, that's so funny. Here's my interpretation. Manager asked me to motivate an employee into doing a job that he doesn't like. This happened around mid-2000. I was a low-level team leader in a tech consulting company. I was in charge of two teams of three each. The client was a bank. If you've ever worked with a bank, you know that technology moves pretty slowly on a bank. For instance, the project that we worked at was in Java 1.3 that got deprecated in March 06. One of the guys on my team, let's call him Max Powers, was the kind of guy that's always, always trying to be on the cutting edge of everything. And we had him working on the project and he asked several times to migrate the project to a newer version of Java or be assigned to a project with more up-to-date tech. There were, he was just assigned to this one, but I couldn't do any of those things. I knew he was unmotivated because of this, and I was also pretty bummed about having to work with outdated technology. So we both started researching open source tools to use in the company that were cutting edge, and proposed some improvements to our manager. He liked the idea, so we formed a task force to create tools for the company. The force was Max and myself. However, this was a side job. Our main responsibilities were still on the bank project. One day, on a team project leaders and managers meeting, we were talking about desired and undesired rotation, people leaving the company, and how to stop it. I brought Max's case up, saying that having someone extremely focused on cutting edge technology doing boring outdated stuff probably was the recipe to undesired rotation. The manager said, you're wrong, this is totally desired rotation. We want people motivated to work here. He's not. I said, but he's not because you're unwilling to move it to a project with better tech. Plus, he's one of our best assets by a mile. He's doing the work of two to three people and the task force. We wouldn't want him to leave, it would be a problem. Then the manager said, then it's your fault, you have to motivate him better. I stopped arguing. To me, Max leaving was totally a case of undesired rotation. It was a problem to my planning and furthermore, it was losing somebody who I saw was one of the top assets available in the company. But the manager said that I needed to motivate Max better. Cue the malicious compliance. So I did. I motivated him to get the hell out of the company. He wasn't going to be allowed to work in cutting edge projects there. He found a new and exciting job in no time. He's a millionaire now. He got called by Google to interview with them. He rejected the offer. He could have been retired by 38, but he kept on working because he still loves what he does. We struggled to cover him. We had to hire two more developers and the task force came to an end. I couldn't do it all by myself and the rest of the devs weren't as interested. Wow, that's so awesome and so deserved as well. And so silly on the part of the manager. Yeah, good on you, OP for convincing them to leave. Job wanted work shirts back when I quit. They received a pie 
pile of muddy ashes. Back on February 23rd of 2014, a Sunday, I was driving home from going clothes shopping for my new job I was starting in a week, when my car literally caught on fire with me and my then four-year-old son in it. I just bought $200 worth of clothes and my laundry was in my car from the laundromat, including my work shirt and white lab coat. I had already given notice to my boss that I was leaving and the next day, Monday, I called her in to tell her what had happened and that I wouldn't be in due to smoke inhalation issues and also needing to go buy a new car. This was supposed to be my last day. She decides to tell me that I needed to return my three work shirts and both lab coats or I'd have the cost of them taken from my last check. I told her that they were a pile of ash at the salvage yard. She tells me I have to bring them in. Okay, will do. Insert eye roll and a certain finger flashing from my side of the phone. Tuesday I walked in with a picture of my laundry basket melted in my car and a ziplock filled with ashes and mud. I recorded myself giving them to her and telling her again what happened. I got a side eye and a WTF. I walked out with a smirk. Edit to add that I've been at the new job for 10 years in March. Best move I ever made. Also, my wages were never garnished. I don't think they legally could, but who knows? So what, did they not listen to you or something? What the hell do you mean they have to bring the shirts in? They went up in flames. Are you not even listening? Oh, that's so frustrating. Like imagining that you've been in a situation like this and not only does it sound like they don't give a damn that that happened to you. They're like, nah, you still have to bring in the shirts. Yeah, I'm so happy you left that job, OP. My boss told me to gain some perspective. So I did and I found a new job. I worked as a systems administrator for an IT firm. I got tired of dealing with abusive and angry clients for five years. I got tired of being micromanaged and exploited. I got tired of being talked down to like I was a child anytime the slightest little mistake was made. When my boss learnt that I was no longer going to work in another market three days a week like I originally planned and he had no one else because nobody wanted to deal with the jerks in that market. He spent an hour lecturing me on taking a long hard look at myself. He said that he was concerned about my reliability after refusing to spend three hours a day commuting to the other market on top of my work day. If I can't rely on you to work in the other market then I just don't know if you have much of a future with this company. I think you need to take a long hard look at yourself and gain some perspective. You know what? You're absolutely right. Two weeks after I found a new job and gave my notice. He begged me to stay, offered me more money and this went on for days. I said, no thanks, I finally found that perspective you wanted me to find. Boy am I glad I did. A new job with a raise and benefits and no stress. The only advice you've ever given me of value. Good luck to you. He let me go a week into my notice. Started the new job, loved my new boss and my co-workers. It's been over a year. The former boss hired six different people to fill my spot. Each of them lasted one to two months before they left. Hmm, yeah, I wonder why that is. Maybe he needs to gain some perspective on how to run a company and treat people. Yeah, once again, I'm so happy you did this OP. The top comment says gain some perspective. Whoa, the perspective from outside this crappy office is amazing. Wait, not like that. And also the audacity of them to say all of that and then beg you to stay. Yeah, amazing job OP. The next one is called food allergy charity doesn't want to pay their bills. Enjoy a nutty party. I work in a food catering place which can fulfill allergy free requests. We have the expertise and care not to include allergic food, either as hidden ingredients or by accidentally sharing contaminated utensils and pans while cooking. In our experience, the four most common allergies are peanuts, tree nuts, eggs and milk. Cooking meals without these four ingredients will usually satisfy everybody at an event. We had a new client, a food allergy advocacy group. They ordered a large catering last month and didn't pay a cent. We were out of pocket $2,000 and were considering legal action. This charity had the nerve to place another order with us, but this time a smaller one costing $450. The group asked for the meals to be nut-free vegan instead of nut egg milk free, as this would ensure them a peanut, tree nut, egg and milk free event for cheaper, as they'd avoid our additional allergy free preparation fees. This was reckless behavior from the advocacy group, as the party attendees were most likely anaphylactic to milk and egg. Think deadly peanut allergies, but for dairy, milk, cheese and cream, and egg products instead. Had we not known they were a food allergy charity, then we wouldn't have taken as much care in ensuring the meals were egg dairy free, and would have just focused on the nut free angle instead. There was one important thing the charity forgot. It's now possible to buy dairy which is made from lab grown milk from yeast. The protein is identical to milk but is technically vegan. We cooked all the meals with this lab grown dairy and loaded it in the van. Upon arriving to the function hall, we informed the charity organizers that the meals had lab grown dairy in them. The charity owner started blasting off on how it was meant to be dairy free and how they have people deathly allergic to milk in the event. I simply explained that the order was nut free vegan since we used lab grown milk and that they'd failed to pay us the last order and that this was simply going to be our team Christmas party if they didn't accept the order. The owner went ballistic and began pushing me. The rest of us restrained him 
and the function hall called the police. The owner lied and told the police that we had dropped and assaulted him. The police asked the function hall for the CCTV and then moved us both along. The police did inform us that we could head down to the station tonight and provide a witness statement if we wanted to press charges. A few moments later, the owner called and begged for an apology and offered to pay us both the original and today's invoices right there and then. I decided to take the apology and the cash. Our team had a nice pre-Christmas party with the vegan lab-grown dairy meals. I'm addicted to reading these. Like this comment says, not sure why you catered the second event when they hadn't even paid for the first. Yeah, that's the only bit that I'm confused about too. Obviously, I don't have a catering business, but shouldn't they pay you first? But OP said here, we knew that they'd reject the order and thought to prepare ourselves a little Christmas party. The next one is called Never Touch Your Truck Again. You got it, neighbor. I posted this on MI The A-Hole subreddit, but many people were saying that it belongs here. I-59 male live in a major city in Ontario, Canada. I live in a small subdivision and I have five neighbors total on my street. For the past few years during the winter when we're getting a lot of snow, all bad storms, as I'm leaving for my overnight shift at around 8 to 9 p.m., I'll put my wife's windshield wipers up on her car and do a quick walk around to my other five neighbors and also put their windshield wipers up on their cars. Obviously not if they're outside or something, but if it looks like they're in for the night, many of them forget to do this as many of them have children and it typically slips their mind. And yeah, their wipers will be frozen to their car in the morning. It's just something nice I like to do to look out for my neighbors. They're always grateful of this and they thank me for it. Many of them have started doing it too and there'll be nights where I'll forget to put mine up and my wife's up and in the morning one of the neighbors has done it. Anyway, recently one of our neighbors moved and a new family moved in as of last week. It's a young couple and their two children. The other night I was leaving for my overnight shift at around 9 p.m. It was snowing really heavy and we were supposed to be getting almost 30 centimeters of snow and it was freezing out. So I put my wife's wipers up and I do my usual quick walk around to the other neighbors. I was hesitant when I reached my new neighbor's house as I've only introduced myself once, but I did it anyway. As I was putting the second wiper up on their pickup truck, the husband came charging out of his front door yelling, hey, what the hell are you doing to my truck? I tried to explain to him. I was just putting his wipers up to help him. He continued to scream at me, get the hell off my property and don't touch my crap again. The wife then came out and started yelling at me too. I apologized and I started walking away. Some of my other neighbors heard the commotion and came outside to see what was happening. They tried explaining to him too. It's just something that we do. Both of them weren't having it. Fast forward to this morning, I'm arriving home from my overnight shift and as I'm walking in, I see the wife of the couple struggling outside to break the ice off the windshield wipers. I guess she was trying to take her kids to school and the wipers were frozen solid on the car. She sees me and yells over, hey there, do you mind giving me a hand please? I look over to her and I yell back, no, sorry, I thought I was never to touch your crap again, ma'am. And I walked away back inside. She yelled at me, well, a-hole. I told my wife about this. She thinks I should have helped her because she was just trying to get her kids to school. I disagree as I was only following what they told me. Yeah, no, you definitely did the right thing, OP. Like I understand somebody being surprised and freaking out a little bit if they see somebody touching their car. But once you explained what you were doing and also that the neighbors explained, they should have stopped and they should have relaxed. And yeah, that's right, OP. You're doing what they said. You did the right thing. The next one is called, I don't think your kid will like my candy lady, but whatever. Since there's only a week left of summer, I decided to take the kids to the local amusement and water park today. As I've gotten older, the rides have gotten a little tougher to me. In addition, my daughter tends to get motion sick rather easily. I don't like the way motion sickness pills make me feel, so I always take a Ziploc baggie full of ginger candy along to prevent and soothe nausea. Today, I had chewy mango ginger candies, hard plain ginger candies, and hard lemon ginger candies. For those who've never had ginger candy, it's spicy. The lemon ginger is probably the mildest. The plain ginger is just plain hot. The mango ginger are sweet and spicy, but they also stick to your teeth like crazy. They're definitely an acquired taste. As we're standing in line for the long ride, I pull out my baggie. I choose a lemon one, as does my son, 13. My daughter, 12, asked me for a mango one. While I'm fishing a mango one out, I hear the kid in front of us tell his mum that he, around seven-ish, wants some candy. His mum distractedly says that she doesn't have any candy. The boy says, but she does. He turns to me and asks me for one. I tell him I don't really think he'd like my candy. By this time, his mum focused in on our interaction. As the kid starts to whine that, of course, he'd like my candy, his mum just huffs and says, you've got a whole bag. Can't you give him just one? Come on, don't be greedy. Oh, you said the magic word there, lady. I say, all right, and I dig out a lemon one. I'm not completely heartless. That's when the kid whines that he wants a mango. Mango is his favorite. I tell him lemon is better, but he insists on mango. I tell him it's kind of sticky as I hand it over. The kid rips it open and shoves it in his mouth, gets in three quick chews while my kids stare at him. Then he actually starts to taste it and a look of horror comes over his face. He screams and tries to spit it out. He's jumping around and flapping his arms 
arms. His mom's panicking and asking me what's wrong. He's screaming that it's bad and it's hot and he wants it out. His mom tells him to spit it out. That's when I pipe up with the very helpful. It's really sticky. What's left is probably stuck in his teeth. He'll have to wait for it to melt off if he doesn't want to chew. The mom looks at me in disbelief and a shrug. Then she asks what in the hell I gave her son. Probably should have asked that sooner, lady. I answer, ginger candy. It's good for nausea. I'm pretty sure I'd be dead if looks could kill. We got to move up in line two spaces though because she took her kid off to the water fountain. I'd like to think the kid will think twice about demanding things from strangers. Plus, it was entertaining. Overall, the kids and I counted it as a win. Oh, that's so funny. And also awful at the same time. And yeah, like this comment says, that's what they get for demanding that other people not be greedy with their own stuff. I hope the kid learned a valuable lesson about entitlement mentality. Yeah, and also the mum. They were just as entitled, calling OP greedy for nothing. Karen demands to go through bear territory. Almost gets mauled by a grizzly. Well, we're starting the episode like this. So, for a little context, this story is not mine. This happened to my father in the 80s and 90s. But I'll write it in the first person because English is hard. In the 80s, I lost everything I could. I dropped out of college. My father died of a heart attack and my mother was somewhere in the wind. I wasn't worth the air I was breathing. As a last effort, I saved up some money to move to a different state so I could start fresh. I chose Montana to be my new home. Because I didn't have a college degree, I knew I I could only make a living with my hands and not my head. After a bit of looking around, I found work on a ranch. The owner of the ranch, let's call him Jack, took me under his wing. He taught me how to ride a horse, how to herd, how to do cutting, roping, and many other useful skills on a ranch. My goal was to have enough money for a deposit so I could buy a house, or at least some land. After about three years, I had the money, but I loved the ranch and the folks so much that I chose to stay longer. In the spring of 88, I finally made the decision to quit. I was fully honest with Jack about what my intentions were. I told him I wanted to buy some land to have a ranch of my own and potentially get married and start a family. Being the absolute champ, Jack offered me some contacts of people who were selling land. After some time, I chose a piece of land near Jack's ranch. I got a loan, I bought the land and in the summer, I started building my house. By winter, the house was done and it was planned that in the spring, I'll build a barn and some fences. In the spring, it was back to work and before summer started, I had nothing to do. I had a lot of time on my hands while I was waiting for all the paperwork to be done and I wasn't gonna spend two weeks sitting on my porch doing nothing when Jack promised me that if I ever needed it, he would give me a job. Now, I didn't need a job because of money, but I just didn't have anything to do. So I went to my good old friend Jack to see if he needed some help. He said that he could use me to guide people on the tours that he was offering. His ranch is not only in the cattle business, he also offers tours of the pristine nature on his property. I happily accepted the job despite me not liking people, but still, it was better than me just sitting on my front porch and doing nothing. The first few days went without a problem, but then a wild Karen appeared to brighten up the day. I was returning from a tour when I saw this Karen in the middle of the field yelling at this girl who was also a guide. I didn't know the girl, but in my books, whoever makes a girl cry is an a-hole. I came over to them and in the most passive-aggressive voice I can, I say, Good day, what seems to be the problem? And the Karen's wrath was now aimed at me, and she yelled back, This biatch has no respect for the desires of the customer. Give me a manager now. Now, I didn't expect such strong wording, but I kept my cool despite my hot-headedness. And I came up to the girl, who's now sobbing because this Karen was mouthing off to her pretty good. And I say to her, Leave it to me, I'll take care of her. You go take a break and tell Jack that I'll be with this piece of work. She gives me a grateful smile and nod and then rides away. I go to the Karen and I say to her, ma'am, I can't get you the manager as he's busy right now, but if you want, I can be your guide instead of her for the remainder of the tour. She replies very politely by saying, sure, I think even the trees will be better than that, B. Arch. Every part of my hot-headed self wants me to pretty much bury this woman right then and there, but I keep my cool and we head off on the tour. And within the first minute, what a piece of work she truly is. She's behaving like she knows best and everybody is lesser than her and everything should be given to her. When we're about to turn around and go back, I give her a choice. We could either go the official route or we could return by the unofficial route, which is shorter, but there were bear sightings reported in the past few days. I tell her that the unofficial route is quite dangerous, but just as I wanted her to do so, she vehemently objects because she is the wisest person alive and knows the best. Great, my trap had worked. After about five miles on this unofficial route, she starts screaming and turns so pale that she She's even more white than paper. In the distance, there's a grizzly. I knew about the danger that I dragged both of us into, but in the end, it was technically her choice to go on that route. I tell her to make herself as big and loud as she can. I follow suit, but the bear keeps getting closer. It keeps growling at us. With every growl, Karen was getting even more pale. After it gets way too dangerous, I shoot around out of my rifle, and the bear gets scared and runs away into the woods. The entire ride back, she keeps yelling at me that I put her intentionally in so much danger. And yeah, I'll admit, it was quite reckless taking a visitor 
into a part of the woods where there were bear sightings reported. But technically, she made the decision to go on that route. I stay silent the entire ride because I can't keep a straight face. I was laughing maniacally in my head. And I knew that if I looked at her, I would start laughing out loud. When we returned, she was shaking violently and was pale as ever. After I tied up her horse, she demanded that I get her the manager. And I gladly pointed her to the little building in the distance. And she storms off. She starts yelling at Jack. And I can see that Jack is trying his hardest not to break out laughing. I could hear that she was demanding that I be fired. But the neat part was, I wasn't an employee of Jack's. I was doing it as a favor for a friend. And thus, I couldn't be fired. After the Karen's tirade ends, Jack comes to me laughing like a kid. And he asks me, how did you even come up with that? I start giggling as well. And I answer, well, she made the girl cry. So I wanted to give her special treatment. I heard of the bear sightings and it worked out well in my favor. He then asked me not to do that again as it was reckless. And I agree and I tell Jack, I don't plan on doing it again. But I had a plan if the bear mauled that damn wretch. My defense would be that I gave her the choice to go on a safer path. But because she was apparently of higher intellect than me, I simply agreed. Jack smiles and heads off. Years later, my father would end up meeting that girl guide again. Her name was Abby. But nowadays, I simply call her mum. Oh, wow, that's such a cute ending. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. So they got together and they had you and she's your mum. Oh, OP, that's such a good story. Yeah, that was so fun and such a good start to the episode. This comment, this is the most boomer thing I've ever read. Because I didn't have a college degree, I knew I could only make a living with my hands and not my head. My goal was to have enough money for a deposit so I could buy a house or at least some land. After about three years, I had the money. Yeah, I was thinking that too. Oh, the simpler times. Yeah, that was so fun to read. Story number two is called Husband Tries to Warn Neighbors About Their Landscaping. Gets told to mind his own business. Some background, my husband is pretty handy. Prior to COVID, he'd done several flip houses as a fun side gig. It's what he loves to do. And he became very familiar with a ton of city codes. During COVID, seems everybody was suddenly buying houses to flip out of boredom. And the prices skyrocketed, so he put that on hold. So then he started doing household repairs and upgrades, building fences, etc. Around the neighborhood as well. To get a better understanding of the neighborhood HOA bylaws and whatnot, he joined the HOA architectural committee. In that, he learned all there was to know about what was allowed and what was not allowed, how the process worked, how to work around things, etc. Long story short, my husband was very knowledgeable in what to do and what not to do, and various processes with the neighborhood and the city. Our next door neighbor decided they were going to start landscaping their backyard, and they, I guess, planned to make theirs as similar to our backyard as possible. The problem was, despite being next door neighbors, our land was quite different. For one thing, behind our house was a bunch of brush and pine trees, maybe three or four feet from the lake that's at the back of the house. We didn't have to do a whole lot to clear the area, but the brush on their property was about a third of their yard, I'd say 10 feet from the water. Also, the way the house is on our street are, the land naturally made like a valley, where the house to our right is at the top and we're in the middle, and the next two houses are at the bottom before it very quickly rises up again. The first thing the neighbors did was cut down all of the trees in their backyard. They were not small trees either, but four story tall trees or more. My husband and the neighbor were talking about the backyard plans when my husband casually mentioned that he was surprised that the city gave him permission to cut down so many trees. In our city, you had to have an arborist give permission to cut down any trees that were so-and-so feet tall. Neighbor first said that it wasn't the city's business what he did with his backyard, and then told my husband to mind his own business. Okay, fair enough. Then they started putting up the retaining wall to bring it up to level with our property, which would have been about seven to eight feet tall. Basically, they were just stacking a bunch of cinder blocks. My husband uneasily asked if their landscapers had ever done a retaining wall like that, and if the city approved it. The city says that if a retaining wall is over five feet tall, you need a structural engineer to come out. Neighbor said again that it wasn't any of the city's business what he did to his yard and for my husband to mind his own business while they're filling up the backyard to bring their level to ours. The landscapers are dumping all the dirt, gravel and sand in the street, blocking a little over half the road. Several of the neighbors who had trucks would just hop the curb, but my other neighbors with smaller cars were mad. Before my husband could ask if they could put the dirt and stuff in their driveway instead of the road, like everyone else, neighbor went off on my husband and told him to F right off. Well, okay then. My husband let them continue working and didn't say a word as they started constructing a 10 foot tall fence, which was against HOA regulations. Fences couldn't be taller than six foot. Between them starting construction six days a week before 7 a.m. and then blocking the road, I guess somebody had had enough. Next thing I know, city officials are out here putting a big ass sign in the yard saying that all construction was to be halted until further notice. It wasn't us, but my husband found out through the architectural committee that somebody had complained about the noise and also the road blockage to the HOA, who came out to investigate, saw everything that they'd done, and then reported them to the city. They got a hefty fine for every tree stump the city official found. The structural engineer said their retaining wall was not sound and had to be redone, and it had to have regular inspections during its build. The HOA also told them that 
that not only did they have to take down their 10 foot tall fence, but as they did not get prior approval and because it was not an approved design, the HOA also hit them with a hefty fine. Initially the neighbour came after us for tattling but we told them that it wasn't us as nothing they did affected us in any way. Our kids are early risers so even starting before 7 didn't bother us. My husband then said that he tried to warn them this would happen but the neighbour told him to F off and to mind his own business and he did. Landscaping had started on Black Friday, was shut down for 3 weeks while I guess they got things sorted out with the city and the HOA. Their backyard is still not finished. Edit, I truly want to say it wasn't us that called the HOA or the city. We let him be but he pissed off a lot of neighbours. When cutting down those trees he had chainsaws and the wood chippers going off by 6.45 in the morning and the bobcat being used by 7am 6 days a week. Other neighbours tried to ask him to put his dirt on his driveway instead of the street. He told them often to mind their own business too and a few people went ballistic on him when their car slid a little bit after the rain that we had turned the remaining dirt to mud. The school bus could also easily have complained to somebody about it too as it was a big ordeal for them. Also there were other things he did to his front yard that we didn't warn him about either and he got dinged for but I made this post mostly about him trying to go against the city although the changes he made to the driveway also got dinged by the city. And yeah from what I heard the tree finds were painful. Edit number two. No really it wasn't us. <laughs> although not gonna lie we almost ratted them out when they took out the beautiful oak tree in their front yard. Put up a 20 foot flag pole and put up a Chicago Bears flag. My husband can't stand them but we still kept quiet and that flag pole was taken down about a week later. Again it could have been the HOA or city noticing on their own or a neighbour reporting them because the clanging it made all day and night was awful. Yeah and they get what they deserve. Being so bloody rude telling your husband to F off and stuff and being an awful neighbour sucked in. That's so frustrating and satisfying at the same time. Like oh no what a shame you got in a whole bunch of trouble. Maybe you should listen to people in the future and also not be so rude. That was so fun to read. The next one is called Christmas Karen Wants Boneless Chicken Breast. This one's a few years back but working this holiday season I retold the story to co-workers and I felt this was a good place to post it. Also it's a bit of a long one. To preface I'm a career butcher and at the time was working for the food hole. If anybody isn't familiar the meat department becomes crazy around November and doesn't abate until after Christmas. We took holiday orders in person then, now mainly all online unless they're odd. As you might imagine the orders are usually for standing rib roast, tenderloins, hams, turkeys and ducks and geese. They really add up and for my boss sorting all the paper orders is a nightmare. And to Karen, I would like to place a holiday order. Me gets relevant information. Cool, what would you like on the 24th? Karen, one pound of boneless chicken breast. Me, oh no problem, you actually don't need to order that. We'll have plenty of regular chicken, steaks and burgers. You only need to place an order for roasts etc. Karen, I had to wait forever last year. This year I don't want to wait, so I'll order it. Me, we'll have two lines. So if you're just coming in for regular items, you won't need to wait in the order line. Karen, but I want to make sure. At this point I was already way done, so I decided I would comply maliciously. I took her order, then proceeded to inform every single person in my department of the situation and the plan. The day of she came up, told the guy at the counter she wanted chicken breast. Having been warned by me, he asked, did you pre-order it? Karen, yeah. Co-worker, okay let me go search the sheet to find your order. Karen, you can just grab it from the case. Co-worker, no we've already put yours away. I'll find it. I wouldn't want it to get lost in the cooler and then go banned over Christmas. Karen, frustrated, okay. Co-worker goes to her order book, searches and finds her name and then says, okay I found you on the list. Now I just have to find your order. Co-worker enters the cooler and as trying to find a pack of chicken breast in a cooler full of roast is like trying to find a needle in a haystack. It took him about 15 minutes. At multiple points through the ordeal other employees greeted her. She tried to get them to get her chicken breast and they all told her because I'd warned them that she had to wait for the one specifically put aside for her. I estimate that she waited about 30 minutes including the line time to get to our counter. Edit since a few of you asked or remarked I cut out most of our dialogue for clarity as much of it was me trying differently worded ways to explain to her that placing an order would be self-defeating. She just wanted to avoid the line at the holiday table. Additionally this was before the pandemic and we literally had never been out of boneless chicken breast so I guaranteed she'd get them either way. Yeah I don't feel like that's a Karen. The top comment says for one pound of chicken breast. Wow she was really worried about that. At my local butcher that's like a single breast. Yeah like that's confusing. But also it doesn't really sound like they did anything that bad. Yeah like this comment says depending on her actual attitude I don't really see what she did wrong here. She spent last year on the 24th a day I assume she'd rather be spending with her family in line waiting for something which just makes everybody's life worse. So this time she tries to order ahead. You give her some stuff about two lines which means nothing. As you explained it, maybe you explained it better to her. But just saying there are two lines doesn't really abate the I want 
to make sure I get the food and not stand in line for over an hour on Christmas Eve, worry. Now I get working on the holiday sucks, but unless there's a whole part about this attitude that you're not saying, it really just sounds like you're getting glee about somebody not wanting to take up more of her own, and therefore your time. Yeah, that's what I'm confused about. It didn't need to be an issue. Like, yeah, whatever, a pound of chicken breast, but surely you would just do it anyway, and there'd be no issue. Story number four is called, okay, you win. We'll practice and play on the other field. Several years ago, I coached a kid's soccer team. It was a community recreation league with volunteer coaches with a focus on fun and equal playing time. There were two fields next to a school. The third field is a two minute walk away and hidden behind a thick stand of trees, invisible from the two fields. One would never know it was even there, but did have a small parking lot next to it, accessible only by a rarely used poorly maintained back lane. Most people would park in the school lot and walk the two minutes along the path through the trees. The two fields next to the school were typical school fields. Not particularly well maintained, uneven and definitely not regulation sized. They were typical school fields. The third one was regulation sized, perfectly maintained, had new bleachers and was maintained like a professional field with regular waterings, cutting and seating. It was the groundskeeper's pride and joy. It was the first day of a new season and my team of 10 year olds, the brown pandas, our t-shirts were brown with pandas on them, showed up for our first practice. Except there was another team on our assigned field, a team of talented players with matching socks and shorts, were all wearing cleats and in their late teens. I approached the coach and I explained that he was on our field and that his field was a two minute walk away down the path. He politely told me to take a hike. He was there first and that was that. So not looking for confrontation, I took my team to the really nice field. The parents had bleachers to sit in and we had a great time on the big boy field. After the practice, the groundskeeper asked me why we were practicing on the field. I told her what happened with the other coach. She told me she asked the other coach to switch the field also. He told her to get stuffed and that it was his field. Two days later at our second practice, his team was on our field again. The convener called me over to talk to her and the other coach. Just to confirm, for the rest of the season, you're switching fields with the brown pandas on the far field and your team on this field here? Yeah, this is our field and the little kids will be on the far field. He looked at us arrogantly. Fine by me, I stated. Grabbed my big net sack of balls and I trudged over to the professional field. Two glorious weeks passed when during the practice, the other coach came over with his team and they saw our field. He approached me and told me that we needed to switch. I laughed in his face. Go get the convener over here so we can discuss. I turned my back on him and probably did something like tie a kid's shoe or dry some tears. Remember, they were 10 year olds. His team started trying to use our field. One of the brown pandas was scared of the bigger kids and started crying. A couple of parents stepped in and started shooing them away before one of the 10 year olds got hurt. He returned with his entire team and the convener. She was beaming. She asked him if he remembered our conversation of two weeks ago. He started to argue. She told him that we were keeping with the terms of that agreement and to go back to his own field. Go on, scoot. I remember her saying. We had our first game the next week. All the brown panda parents were in attendance watching their children playing soccer on a beautiful field with semi-comfortable seating and a working scoreboard. As we left, we walked by the other team playing on an undersized muddy field. They eventually changed their game dates and times so they could use the big field, but had to practice on the old field. The brown pandas never had to set foot on the old field all season. Wow, that's so awesome. And that's what they get for being a dingbat. People are so awful and they think nothing bad's gonna happen. Like, yeah, that's what you get for being so rude. Hell yeah, OP. Okay, let's read one more. Story number five is called Stick to Your Crappy Wedding Playlist. Okay. Prior to 2020, I was a wedding DJ. I started DJing for friends right after college and I gradually got more and more gigs through word of mouth. Like any new endeavor, in the beginning, my services were priced aggressively low to get business. Also, I was more willing to travel long distances to get a gig and a good review. A few years in, and I'd had enough clout to be choosier about my gigs, but one day I got an email from a friend of a former bride. She asked if I could do the same package, which included a lower price and a distance further than I like to travel. I decided it was worth it. The weekend was open and I'd probably get a good review. The wedding's going fine and we're about an hour into the dancing when the bride's sister approaches and asks me to play some 90s pop song, Britney or something. I don't recall exactly. I oblige and I turn it on. Within seconds, the bride stumbles over to me and screams, do not play anything that Biatch is asking for. This song is on my do not play list. Stick to the playlist I gave you. I'm very taken aback. A key tenant of DJing is understanding what songs a client does not want to hear. I quickly look at the do not play list and this song is definitely not on it. Furthermore, the playlist the bride had provided sucked. I normally tell couples that I'll stick to their list, but if the party needs some more oomph, I will go and do my own thing. After all, hopefully a DJ can adapt to the moment better than a pre-made playlist. But after giving this bride a discount, driving further than I wanted, and being drunkenly berated for something that wasn't even true, I just didn't care. For the next one and a half hours, I only played the worst songs from her list and didn't even try to create a flow. The party totally died. I never got that review. Worth it. Edit my 
My typical approach and that of most DJs is to ask for a list of songs from the couple, use that to determine the style and vibe they're going for, and then to play those songs while mixing in other choices along the way. This is part of the initial discussion and understood and agreed to by the couple. We also talk about whether or not requests should be allowed from the crowd. This wedding was no different. The couple were fine with this approach. That's why they hired me actually, because it worked so well at their friend's wedding two years earlier. No way would I intentionally just start playing whatever I wanted to if the bride specifically asked me not to do so. Also, last paragraph is hyperbole. I didn't intentionally try to play the worst songs. I just stuck to the list. It didn't flow all that well, but that's what happens sometimes with a firm playlist. Yeah, so definitely some miscommunication. And also, if they're only playing a playlist, why even hire a DJ? Management says I'm losing my unused vacation days because of a new unpublished handbook rule. Okay, I'll comply with the rules of this new unpublished handbook, but these four paid unused vacation days will cost you thousands. I worked for a company with great pay and benefits, one of which was vacation days. I worked there for years without any performance or attendance issues. I was also an employer who would not work overtime. I give 100% while I'm there, and that's all I have to offer. Besides that, no issues. Each year, I'd pre-plan my vacation days. We had to put our plans on a calendar for approval and I wanted to receive my approval before confirming my plans so I did everything as early as possible. I had no vacation request problems for years and I didn't hear of any other employees having issues with their vacation time or pay. Then one year all of a sudden after using all but four of my vacation days, management said I had no additional paid vacation time. I reviewed our online handbook, gathered my request and I approved time off and also checked my check stubs to verify the paid vacation days I'd taken thus far. I presented everything to management for research. My direct manager said that he checked and I didn't have four additional vacation days. That wasn't good enough, so I asked him to forward it to his manager. His manager said the same thing. That wasn't good enough. Eventually, my concerns reached the centre manager. The centre manager called me into a meeting. I again presented my findings, showing that I had four unused vacation days left. He then began discussing changes to our vacation policy while making eye contact and smiling. He turned his computer around to show me the new handbook that they constructed, reflecting the new vacation policy. Wait a minute, what? There's an online employee handbook handbook, yet I'm supposed to go buy a new handbook that's not known to employees? Make that make sense? I politely said, okay, and walked out. I removed my four days from the vacation calendar. I then began chatting with other employees to see the number of days they'd taken that year and the number of days they might have left. Conversations like, how was your vacation? How long did you stay? Are you choosing a different place to spend the rest of your vacation days? Asking these and related questions allowed me to calculate the number of vacation days they used or had remaining. I did not find one other employee having my issue with vacation time. I waited a couple of months and I filed a lawsuit while working there. Other employees did not know about my lawsuit, at least not from me, but I'm sure management knew. The lawsuit discovery process revealed an email chain. The email chain showed the centre manager directly asking human resources about my four unused vacation days and human resources confirming that I had four unused vacation days. The centre manager used a fictitious new handbook to cover his and other management actions, denying my unused vacation time. Shortly after that, we settled and they paid thousands of dollars for unused vacation days. I had to resign, of course, and the centre manager and other management lost their positions or retired or quit. All I wanted was my unused paid vacation time, but what I received was much more. Well, wow, that's awesome. Good on you, OP. Yeah, like these comments say, I know a lot of times in the US at least, management is offered bonuses for keeping certain costs down. Many years ago, there was a manager at a grocery store I worked at that received a specific budget to buy grocery bags in a month, and then whatever was left, she got to keep as a bonus. So we became the store famous for needing to borrow boxes of bags at the end of the month from other stores around us. And OP said, Oh wow, she found a loophole to keep additional company funds. That might have been what was happening. And I stopped it. After getting confirmation from human resources, they never explained why they lied. The next one is called suspended for being a minute late. Fine, enjoy handling the biggest project without me. Hey there Reddit, I've been a long time loca on this subreddit. And after what happened at my job recently, I just knew I had to share my story. It's a bit of a long one, but trust me, it's worth it. So I'm Mark and for the past five years I've been working at this mid-sized tech company. It's been great, or at least it was, until six months ago when we got a new HR manager, Susan. Now Susan is the kind of person who loves rules a bit too much. She came in with this idea to revolutionize the workplace, but all she did was implement a bunch of unnecessary and strict policies. The one that really got under everybody's skin was her new attendance policy. It stated that if anybody was even a minute late more than three times a month, they'd face immediate suspension without pay. Oh my god, no excuses, no 
no exceptions. This was crazy considering we're all seasoned professionals, not school kids. But Susan was adamant and the policy was enforced to the letter. The fact that they feel like that's okay is so awful. Like, yeah, you're not school kids. And a minute late? That's a joke. Now, I'm usually very punctual, but life happens, right? Just my luck, I ended up being late three times in one month. The first time was due to a massive traffic jam. The second was due to a power outage that killed my alarm. And the third, well, I overslept. Each time, I was barely five minutes late, but Susan didn't care. She slapped me with a suspension notice. I was fuming, but then I remembered something important. Our employee handbook. I'd read that thing cover to cover when I first started, and something about the suspension policy stood out to me. I dug up my copy, and I found the section I was looking for. The policy stated that suspended employees must leave company premises immediately and are not allowed to engage in any work-related activities during their suspension. A plan started to form in my head. You see, at that time, I was in the middle of a critical project for a major client. It was a huge deal for the company, and I was the lead developer. Without me, the project would grind to a halt, so I decided to follow Susan's policy to the letter. The next day, I walked into Susan's office and I handed her the suspension notice, along with a printed copy of the employee handbook suspension policy. I told her, as per the company policy, I'll be leaving the premises immediately and I will not partake in any work-related activities during my suspension, including the Johnson Project. The colour drained from her face. You can't just leave the Johnson Project. But I just shrugged and said, Company policy, Susan. I'm sure you wouldn't want me to break the rules. I gathered my things and I left the office. The fallout was immediate. The project team was in disarray without me and the client was getting antsy about the missed deadlines. The CEO himself called me two days into my suspension, begging me to come back. I explained that I was merely following company policy as enforced by Susan. Long story short, the CEO had to intervene. My suspension was lifted and I was back at work the next day. The best part? Susan's ridiculous policies were all reviewed and mostly scrapped. She is still with the company, but let's just say her enthusiasm for rulemaking has significantly diminished. So there you have it. Sometimes following the rules a little bit too closely can be the best form of rebellion. And always, always know your employee handbook. Yeah, and also what you did OP is super obvious. Like, of course, if you suspended without any pay, that means you're not working. Yeah, like this comment says, you did the right thing. I would have walked out of there immediately as well, with or without checking the handbook. A suspension means not coming in, so why would you work? Yeah, that's so confusing. Like, did they want you to leave, but they didn't want you to leave when you were super busy? Yeah, what, suspended without pay, but you're also working somehow? And the fact that the bloody CEO had to step in and deal with this, how ridiculous. It's a wonder they didn't lose their job. The next one is called Told to Do What I Have to Do. A post in another group reminded me of this. I'm a disabled veteran, and at the time this actually happened, I was solely depending on a walking stick. I couldn't walk for more than 10 feet maximum without assistance. I was asked by a friend to be a bridesmaid at her wedding. She quickly proved herself to be a bridezilla from hell, and everything had to meet her vision. Everything had to fall within her very rigid scope of what the aesthetic should be. She made a couple of what she claimed were innocent comments about my walking stick. I offered multiple times not to be a bridesmaid and I would assist in any other way I could help. She refused every offer and insisted I had to be a bridesmaid. Then I heard from another close friend, and also a bridesmaid, that she was very upset that I was insisting on using my walking stick. She made a comment saying that she was just gonna hide it and then I'd just have to go without it. Looking at the mutual friend's face when she said that she tried to laugh it off as a joke. Well, there was no doubt in my mind that she was gonna try to have my walking stick go missing. So I made arrangements. Sure enough, the wedding rolls around and while getting my hair and makeup done, my walking stick disappears. I was not happy and I told everyone I have to have it back. I can't walk down the aisle without it. The bride insisted that she didn't know where it was and they looked everywhere and I was just gonna have to make do. I said, so after you joked about taking my walking stick, it goes missing and you want me to make do? Her exact words were, you'll just have to do what you can do to get up the aisle. Yeah, I would not be going to their wedding. Cue the malicious compliance. I texted my boyfriend, he went out to the car and brought in my mobility scooter that I rented just in case I needed it. I had him put it out of sight, but somewhere we could easily get to it. And then he or the other bridesmaids physically supported me. We made our way to the back of the hall for the start of the ceremony. The bride who had been talking to her father and not paying attention didn't see the scooter until she started to walk up the aisle. And there are her three bridesmaids, two standing tall and me sitting on the most hideous looking, multicolored with sparkles mobility scooter that I could find. If looks could kill, she would have planted me. Within seconds of the ceremony ending, my walking stick had been found. She and her new husband brought it over to me and told me it had been found and I could get that god awful scooter back out to the car. I mustered up a tear and I told her I was so sorry but I was in so much pain from having to try to walk without my walking stick that there was no way I'd be able to go without the scooter. I'm very proud to say that that scooter is in over 90% of her wedding photos. Wow. <laughs> and that's what they get too. Good 
on you, OP. How trashy of them to take your walking stick. So yeah, you responded in kind with a trashy mobility scooter. That's so awesome. I'm so unbelievably happy you did this, OP. The next one says, want me to quit arguing with your orders because you know better? Fine. So I work in a print shop and my boss is a huge control freak. And also a know-it-all. She got tired of me questioning her orders one day and told me I was no longer allowed to question what she tells me and to just shut up and do what I'm told. A couple of hours later comes an invitation from the non-profit group she was a member of. And in the customer's email, the location of the event was spelled correctly. But she thought it was wrong and rather than Googling it, she made me change it to what she thought it was supposed to be. So with having been told to shut up and do what I was told, we printed 150 invitations with the wrong event venue name <laughs> and delivered them to the organization, the organization that she was a part of. The next day they call upset because they sent me the correct information and they got cards with the wrong information. Boss lady asked me what happened and I simply said, you told me to change it so I didn't question it and I did what you told me. And the funny thing is she was donating the job so now it cost her twice as much. Yeah, and that's not your fault OP. Obviously they should have double checked something like this. And yeah, you're just doing what they said. I love how these are so frustrating but also so satisfying at the same time. A beautiful sort of balance of the two. The next one is called X won't follow divorce rule that she wrote. X 38 female who is my kid's mum. Really wanted right of first refusal in divorce agreement so she could get extra time with the kids if I 39 male couldn't watch them which is reasonable. But she also wanted it specified that only grandparents and aunts and uncles could watch the kids if she passed on the right of first refusal. She wouldn't admit it but my lawyer suspected the reason she wanted to only allow those specific people was to exclude any romantic partner of mine from babysitting ever. The kids parents would always get first dibs so there was no good reason for that bit of it and honestly a long-term partner is probably going to be better for the kids as a babysitter than my family whose hours away and some of them aren't the most trustworthy i agreed to it in the final agreement under the condition that i get a makeup date anytime she refuses the right of first refusal to avoid giving her the incentive to just say no to every date swap so fast forward to this weekend and i ask if she wants the kids under right of first refusal and she says yes but that she won't give me a makeup overnight because the right of first refusal requires a makeup I tell her that this counts as rejecting her right of first refusal. She gets mad and says I should give her the kids anyway. So I say I need to follow the exact wording of the divorce agreement. And it says only grandparents and aunts and uncles can watch the kids. She didn't put parents in there. So I'm not even legally allowed to let her watch the kids if she's not going to follow the right of first refusal agreement. Oh, that felt sweet to use that stupid rule that she created against her attempt to break the agreement. She was mad, but she finally agreed to a makeup overnight in the end, which is the way it should have been in the first place. Edit, I think it's worth adding that I do believe the end state here was best for the kids, which is the goal. Keeping the placement days 50-50 lets the kids keep seeing each parent as much as they can, and they want to see both parents as much as they can. It promotes parental equality from everyone's view. She's generally a good mum to the kids. I'm a good dad, no real concerns there. But she's willing to try to break the divorce agreement so that she can get more time with the kids by taking time away that I was supposed to be able to spend with the kids. And that's not fair to the kids or to me, and I'm happy I stopped her from doing that. Wow, really fun episode today. Really enjoying this and I hope you guys are too. Let me know down below if you are. The next one is called My Aunt Accused Me of Having a Crush on Her. Wait a second, what? So I made sure she knew how right she was? Hello, I, 24 female, have a completely chaotic dumpster fire for a family. If it isn't one thing, it's the next and as such, I do not visit my family unless forced on or on holidays because they're invited despite my suggestions. Here more recently last summer, I believe, my aunt got into a problem with me, the eldest of my siblings, and my eldest youngest sister. 21 because my aunt felt it was her right to bully and abuse my younger sister through her own children and their phones which okay that was a thing but this post isn't entirely about that I called CPS because of some allegations that came my way about the treatment of my aunt's child and because of that she was trying to figure out who did it and was gossiping with my elder cousin her adult stepdaughter about who it could be and I'm quoting well it could have been OP she does have a crush on me when my cousin looked flabbergasted at such a ludicrous statement my aunt's nine-year-old daughter piped up. It's true, she really does. What the actual hell? So not only is my aunt abusive and less than dirt in my opinion, but she's also completely delusional and is so much so that her children know of this particular belief. Now when I heard this ridiculousness, I didn't know what to do with it really. Like what do you say and do about that? Blow up at her? Call her an insufferable pig? Dive deeper into when she started believing this? Blasting her online, etc. And then malicious compliance came to mind and the Grinch's grin smeared across my face. Starting from that day I heard this rumor and any and every time I saw her, I flirted hard. Oh my god, auntie, aren't you the sexiest thing I've seen today? Oh my god, uncle, I wouldn't let that be you through your fingers. If you ever want a massage, let me 
me know. I'd love to give one to the prettiest girl here. Gosh, there's just no way that you're over 50. Uncle, you're a very lucky man. As examples, I whistle as a greeting to her and I make sure to wink at least one per interaction. She doesn't know my cousin. Her stepdaughter tell me about her accusation. She looks so uncomfortable every time I approach her or even arrive at family gatherings. And I love it. Calm as a witch. Maybe don't bully and abuse your kids and fill your own children with nonsense rumors like your niece, who you've known since you was eight years old wanting to doodle you. I'm never gonna stop. I have a crush on my aunt after all. Edit, something I didn't think I'd have to clear up. I do not have a crush on my aunt. <laughs> Sarcasm is a thing. Not to mention some have said this just makes me look bad. To who exactly? The woman telling her children that her niece wants her? My family? The dumpster fire? Y'all ever heard of a rumor so ridiculous that you just go with it? If I raised a huge fuss about it, that would have made me also look guilty with that logic. This way I have the power and maybe, just maybe, she'll think twice about ridiculous rumors. Edit number two, people worry this will make it worse. I don't know what to say to you really. It probably will. But before this issue, I'd literally never had an issue with her. Always cordial. So if she can manifest this kind of BS in her head with no reason at all, then me not doing anything wouldn't have helped either. Edit number three, I will clarify, I ranted about this ridiculousness to my family that I actually care about. My sisters, my mother and my grandmother, all of which do not speak to my aunt because of some past conflict or another. So to a degree, it's an inside joke at my aunt's expense. Okay, what the hell did we just read? Did we just read a post about somebody's aunt accusing them of having a crush on them? OP did say in the comments that they're related to their uncle, so they're not related by blood to their aunt, but still it's their aunt. Yeah, I don't even know what to say. I feel like it's hilarious what you did, OP. And like you said, you're not gonna make it better or worse. If they're this delusional anyway, you can't really make it any worse, so you're just trying to have some fun with it. Which, yeah, fair enough, that's hilarious. Not hilarious that they think you have a crush on them. That's very concerning. But the way you reacted to this is so funny. Okay, let's move on. We need that in letter form. My company gets a payoff request from a title company. One of our clients has a $1,500 lien on a piece of property. The owner of the property, who also owes the $1,500, is trying to sell. So the title company emails me asking for the payoff amount and other information. I respond to the email answering all of their questions. I get an email back saying they need that information in letter form. I ask if they're serious. They say yes. They also say they need it immediately because closing is scheduled Monday and this was Friday. So I print the email chain and I write a letter that says, please find email chain with the information requested. I dutifully put it in a properly addressed envelope and I toss it in outgoing mail. Sadly, that was after mail cut off, so it was not going to be out until Monday. Monday, I get an email from the title company where their payoff info is. I explain the above. They ask if I can email it to them. Nope, I did that already. Not my fault if that was not good enough for you. I guess you won't close for another five days or so. Then a call from the guy's attorney asking me where the payoff is. I explain the above to him and I remind him he was copied on the emails in question. He called the title company and blew them out of the water. We got our $1,500 the day by personal courier. It was a two hour one way drive for the courier. Edit, I deal with liens hundreds of times a year. They're always done via email. There's abundant law in my state that says that email is a legally binding contract. So the email is sufficient and industry standard. Wow, that's so funny. You said you needed it in letter form and then they turn around and ask you to email it to them, which you already did. Yeah, like this comment says, my reply would be, please send us your request in writing and then wait. The next one is called boss introduces new time tracking tool to avoid time manipulation and it backfires on him. I work in a small startup company of around 12 people. It's a very good atmosphere in the office and everybody pulls their weight and is super motivated. However, our boss likes to micromanage us even though he has no expertise in any of our fields, marketing, design, accounting, especially us in marketing and design suffer a lot from that since he'll make changes to our strategies and posts and website, sometimes without even telling us and then gets upset at us when the customer feedback is bad and we aren't reaching our predicted goals. So recently he told us that the reason he thinks we aren't seeing enough results is because we're manipulating our hours and not actually putting in the work that we should. Until then we each wrote down our hours manually in an Excel sheet. But with the new time tracking tool, he would see how long we work down to the minute. We also could only log in on our desktop PCs and previously approved home office devices, but not mobiles because if you're not at your desk, it isn't work. Yeah, this sounds awful. After our initial shock passed and our boss left for the day, our manager called for a meeting and we came up with a plan. We would do as he says in the most just following the rules sort of way possible. Number one, we would not engage in work-related conversations with him unless we're sitting at our desk and we're clocked in. Number two, any questions by him which are asked after we're clocked out will only be answered once we clock in again the following day. Number three, every phone call, text message or otherwise work-related thing outside of the office would only be answered once there was an option for us to clock in either next day in the 
office or for some of us on our home office device. Number four, since we no longer have the option to shift time manually, all work minutes and hours will be clocked exactly when they took place. Side note, in my country weekends pay better, Sundays have to be paid double and working after 8pm warrants additional financial benefits by law. Previously, if we needed to post something real quick or had a question, we would just add the weekend hours or late time to the upcoming Monday. Basically out of goodwill, but no more of that. And number five, we would stop any independent activity, like posting on social media or writing an email, and would send him everything to approve before following through. After about a week, our boss was so fed up with this, he gave us the option to clock in from our mobile devices so we could get a more immediate response to his questions. However, this of course led to us clocking in more frequently, since as I said, he likes to micromanage and is therefore asking a lot of questions. I'm happy to report that as of 2024, we have abolished the system again and regained most of our independence. And even though our boss is still pissed about how we exploited the system, it brought the team closer and hopefully taught him a lesson. Yeah, good job, OP. That sounded like such a terrible idea from the very start. Like the second we started reading that, it sounded so bad. And yeah, micromanaging and telling you guys what to do when he has no idea what you're doing. My old boss told me to contact his lawyers, so I did. Just a quick disclaimer, this is a burner account because my real account gives away where I'm from and who I am. And if anybody I know sees this post, I'll be easily recognizable. So this started some time back. I got fired from my job due to an injury and I had to be hospitalized for a significant time. In my contract, it stated that if I had more than so-and-so amount of sick days in a 12-month period, I could get my contract terminated with only one month of notice. So that happened and of course I contacted my union. They told me it was a legal termination, but they asked about a specific part of my contract, which was about my commission. Turns out I've missed out on some special commission during my employment, and I totally missed it when I read my contract when I got employed. Can't really get closer to which kind of commission due to my anonymity. My union advised me to contact the boss, show him the part of my contract and proof of the missing commission, and try to get a settlement. I was looking for what's equivalent to 3,000 euros. I went to see my boss and I started with a nice chat. After about 10 minutes, I brought up the issue, and I showed him my contract and I showed him that I've never gotten the commission stated in the contract. My boss told me straight up to contact his lawyers and that we were done talking and told me to leave. So cue the malicious compliance. I went home, looked every paycheck through and I set up a meeting with a lawyer. We found a lot of small mistakes on my paycheck and we summed it all up. We sent an official letter to his lawyers and then got an answer from them a few days later. Now he was willing to settle for the first amount, equivalent to 3,000 euros. I smiled and laughed. No can do, Mr. Boss Man, not anymore. Now I want the full amount, which is equivalent to around 10,000 plus pension plus 15% in damages and all the legal fees and I have proof of everything to back up my claim due date of the court and guess what he lost big time I've now planned a nice vacation and I still have more money than I asked for in the first place wow that's so funny and also so stupid of them to say that like oh why don't you contact my lawyers yeah they did and they won I bet they're wishing they didn't say that now like oh maybe I shouldn't have egged you one about that but yeah hell yeah good job OP you won't let me work from home. Okay, I'll fart up the office. This could also probably go in MIDA whole lull. I'm usually able to work from home, but I go into the office about one day a week. One of the side effects of a medication I'm on is uncontrollable gas. This is one of the less serious, but more annoying and hilarious side effects. And lately it has gotten pretty bad. Since I usually work from home, I asked if I could work from home on my office day. I figured that I'd spare others and only subject myself and my dog. Who can hold his own gas wise anyway? I just said it was because I was having side effects effects, but I kept it vague. I could hear my boss sigh. She said, you need to come in today. We have some new people starting and I told them you'd do a meet and greet and it would look bad if I wasn't there. I didn't think that was a good enough reason, but she kept on insisting. So I took a pill to try and stop the gas and I went into work. The gas pill wears off at about 10 a.m. I did manage to meet the people and it is fine, but then I'm informed that I'm expected to stay in their class and shadow the training. I'm guessing that's the real reason my boss wanted me to come in. At this point, I try to get a private moment to tell my boss, a very classy lady who wears pearls that I be farting but alas she went away to another meeting so the first few times I had to fart I tried to excuse myself but it became so distracting me going in and out of the room that eventually I just decided to let it happen in this room of about 10 of our newest hires somebody must have told my boss on lunch break because I got a private message that said okay you can go home I don't know what other fallout to expect from that but I'm at home with my dog right now just gassing my place up wow that's such a hard situation because you kind of need to explain what's going on 
on. But at the same time, it'd feel so embarrassing. Like where you said there that you told them you were having side effects, but you kept it vague. Like when they didn't believe you there, you really should have been specific. But also your boss should have took your word for it. I like the fact that instead of having a super hard conversation, you just went into work and let it all happen. Like these are the side effects I was trying to tell you about, but you didn't listen, did you? Can't refund an item bought at 70% off? Fine, give me a cash refund at full price. This happened a couple of years ago at Canadian Tire with one of their Mastercraft tools that often go on sale. We were helping my in-laws clear out some old belongings when they were moving. And I found an impact wrench that looked unused with a two-year-old, edit probably much older, receipt attached to it. Father-in-law said there was always a problem with it so he never used it and forgot to return it. I decided to try and return it to Canadian Tire since they do have long warranties on their products. The CSR looked at the receipt for $60 on sale from $200 and said you can't return this item with this receipt. Too much time has passed and the receipt is useless. I tried explaining there were issues with it but she didn't believe me. I googled the issues right there and it came up as a recall item for the exact reason that I stated. I showed it to her and she begrudgingly agreed that I could return it as a recall. She asked for the receipt back so she could refund me and I said no too much time has passed and the receipt is useless. She glared at me and processed a cash refund for $225 including taxes. Damn that's so awesome. So did you know about the recall or when you were googling it at the shop you were like wait a second I don't need a receipt to return this that worked out so well the next one is called upper management of the sports club fires me and cripples their kitchen so I'm a professional chef and I have been for a few years and in Australia apprentice chefs are trained in sort of a college where we learn about 150 recipes now many of the recipes are provided to the students in bulky finicky booklets that you wouldn't really want to take anywhere with you so I started writing some of the recipes in a separate notebook along with some other recipes I'd learned from co-workers or family members and created sort of a pseudo cookbook and I'd often bring this book into the kitchen so I could remember ingredient quantities and cooking times and eventually I'd leave the book in the kitchen pretty much around the clock. What I soon found out was that some of the other chefs in the kitchen were using my cookbook to check official recipes for the restaurant we worked for as typically the head chef would have to tell them and this got annoying for everybody and this restaurant was a part of a popular sports club in the local area so consistency was extremely important to management as such having a written record of the new recipes or changes to long time recipes was really important and as it turned out management had stopped making changes to the official club recipe book a few months before I even started so my book became the de facto official recipe book for a while this was no issue to me and I kept on adding new recipes to it throughout the next few years however after my third year working there I finished my studies and I became fully qualified as a chef so I suddenly became more expensive to keep on as a staff member and as such management started looking for any reason to replace me with a new apprentice eventually they found somebody to replace me and they gave a half assed reason for firing me and told me to take all of my things and leave as I could no longer offer what they were looking for so I took everything I owned and left including the notebook with all the club's recipes for a few days not a whole lot happened but slowly the club's review started complaining about bland food or dry cakes inconsistent classic recipes and every other food related thing you could think of at one point there were 50 negative reviews in a single day which for our town was a massive amount of negative reviews in one day it felt pretty damn good since I felt they deserved it and left me unemployed on short notice however I was offered a new job by a smaller restaurant whose owner knew me from the sports club kitchen the malicious compliance after about a week I received multiple calls and after answering one I heard one of the higher managers at the sports club asking if I could return the book as the kitchen needed it back I obviously laughed and I said firmly that it was my book full of recipes so it wasn't going anywhere near them reminding them that they had told me I could no longer offer what they were looking for the manager clearly began to panic as he offered to give me my job back and quote unquote just let bygones be bygones I already had a new job so I completely brushed off this offer and I ignored him I hung up pretty soon after that I started putting the recipes from my book in the new restaurants menu and it was beginning to attract a few regular customers of the sports club so pretty fast I found myself with more and more responsibility and command within the kitchen to the point that about a third of the menu was from my book now this slow trickle of sports club regulars picked up speed after about three months and led to several high level managers from the club deciding to visit the restaurant that I'd helped build and virtually demanded I give them my cookbook claiming that it would be much more beneficial for the community if they had it my head chef laughed in their faces and told them to piss off it's been about two years and my head chef and I have a very positive relationship and the customer base that we have at the restaurant is better than ever we didn't take every customer from the big club but it was enough damage to their profits to scare a few investors away and also lead to a decent bit of damage to one of the higher managers reputations furthermore the recipe issues and negative reviews led to the majority of the kitchen quitting and according to one of my old 
old colleagues, they cited the lack of support and organization from upper management as the final reasons everybody was quitting. And this led to an even larger dip in the quality of the restaurant food. I also get paid significantly more at this restaurant. And they did all of this so they could save a bit of money. Yeah, save a bit of money, but lose all of their business and then lose a lot more money. Yeah, that's unbelievable. And I'm so happy everything turned out good for you, OP. The next one is called, you don't want to wait patiently for 30 seconds. Then you'll be forced to wait patiently for an hour or more. My dad, 64, had always been a patient man back when I, 32, was younger. But lately, his patience is getting thinner than my receding hairline. Maybe it comes with age, but please do correct me if I'm wrong. He gets frustrated easily on things, even if it's a normal everyday moment, like a long line or light traffic or waiting for people, even if he is early or on time with the appointment. I hope I got my point across. A while ago, I called my supplier to order some copper wire to replenish our stock as I'm doing inventory. We own a small contracting firm. My dad told me to drop what I'm currently doing and drive him somewhere before we go to our supplier to pick up the goods. As I started the car, our supplier texted me to message the said order for confirmation purposes and to avoid any errors. My dad immediately blurted out, that stuff can wait, let's go. Me, but dad, this is from our dad somehow irritated. That can wait, let's go. Me, okay, whatever you say. When we arrived at our supplier store, my dad was surprised as the receptionist told him that we didn't order anything as they didn't receive any confirmation from us. Annoyed dad told me, I thought you'd already called them to order. Yeah, it was the supplier asking for confirmation. You can't even wait 30 seconds for me to reply. You'll be waiting here for 30 minutes or so for it to be done. And we waited for more than an hour as there were a lot of orders before they could even process ours. He's annoyed as hell but doesn't have any choice but to bear the consequences of his impatience. His torment worsened as he can't change the channel on the TV as it shows a sucky afternoon drama. Me? I have my portable game console with me at all times. Time passed like a breeze. Yeah, like what's that? The consequences of your actions? Or consequences of not listening and being impatient? Let me know down below if you're enjoying the episode, guys. It doesn't pay to snoop and then accuse the boss. Not a super grand malicious compliance, but it was my pettiest moment when it comes to work for sure. First, some background. I own a tanning salon and it's open from 9am to 9pm every day. There are usually five to six girls working part-time there and the pay is $12 an hour plus cash commissions on the things they sell, packages and lotions. It's worth mentioning that it's a small non-chain business in a college town. All of the paychecks are kept in a drawer in individual envelopes with the employees' names on them taped shut. They pick up their envelope on payday and it has worked well except for one instance. One employee decided to open everybody's envelopes to see their pay and she was livid that one girl was getting paid $2 more an hour. Instead of just asking me about it, she decided to blast the employee group chat and accuse me of ripping them off. Before you think the same thing, it's worth mentioning again that this is a college town with all college age workers, which for my particular salon, it's meant that it's very hard to consistently have somebody who wants to shut weekends. They're all usually going home, have plans, or want to study, etc. I try to be super accommodating and I work around everybody's schedules to the best of my ability. If somebody says they can't work, I don't ask any questions. I just accept it and I plan accordingly. So the reason this girl made a little extra was because she offered to close both days every weekend because she didn't mind. She didn't want as many week hours so I offered to pay her a little bit extra because it was so difficult to schedule that. And plus, those two days can be a little slow so commissions are usually not as good. I guess the girl who snooped never even bothered to look at the schedule to see if there was maybe a reason that this girl made a little bit more even though she really didn't because she worked so few hours. Cue the malicious compliance. I explained the situation to all the girls. I told the snooper that since she was right, totally a ripoff, I would make sure to fix it. I started scheduling both the snooper and my weekend closer every weekend night for the next three weeks. I really only needed one person working, but I had done a terrible wrong that I needed to be made right at the extra pay for the snooper, of course. I would have done it longer, but she apologized and said she was totally fine going back to how it was because she wanted her weekends back and the extra pay wasn't worth it. I guess we could have decided that together if she had just talked to me in the first place instead of jumping to conclusions. Yeah, that's right, OP, and they shouldn't have gone in the group chat and said you were ripping them off. I feel like you handled this super well. The next one is called someone I barely knew was too lazy to ask me for a reference. Face the consequences. This happened a few years ago. I received a phone call from an HR person from a staffing agency I almost worked for at one point. That's another funny story for another day. I got through the greetings and small talk and got down to business. HR. I have a person you know applying for a job with one of our customers. Me. Sort of confused. Nobody gave me a heads up. Who are you talking about? HR. Your friend Mo. Me. Who? HR. Mo last name. He said he worked with you at the email company. Oh, okay. I remember him, but not sure why he'd put my name down. We didn't work all that closely. I interacted with his team only peripherally. 
because we had equipment in his office. I don't really feel comfortable providing a reference, HR. Well, that's sort of our fault. We sort of pressured him to cough up references on the fly. Me, I don't feel comfortable providing a reference, HR. Come on, we know each other. Help me out. Me, well, not being his manager, I can't discuss his performance, HR. Okay, can I ask you about his technical skills and you comment on those? Me, yeah, fine, ask away, HR. How is Mo with software package number one? Me, uh, okay, I guess two and a half out of five. A five out of five is extremely rare for this software. I might be 4.7 and I've used the software for 20 plus years and even flown to the vendor's HQ to work on technology issues and help design future versions of products with them. HR, great. How is he with hardware platform one? Me, well, in the time he was at the email company, he never touched the platform. If he gained knowledge from elsewhere, I can't comment. HR, wait, that can't be right. He said he led hardware platform number one. Refresh project. Me, well, that's not true. HR, email company is huge. Is it possible you weren't aware of the project? Me, no, I'm very aware of the project and he wasn't leading it. HR, how can you be so sure? Me, because I led that project. HR, very uncomfortable. Oh, me, I think it's best for everybody if we end the call here. I think you have a phone call to make. HR, yeah, that's probably best. I didn't necessarily bash him, but just set the record straight. Right, so Mo must have put you as a reference, but not actually expected you to get cold. Because why would they pretend they did your job if they're going to call you as a reference? But yeah, it's a mess around and find out sort of situation. Like, of course that wasn't going to work. And on that note, I feel like that's enough for this subreddit for today. I hope you guys had a wonderful time. But we need to read something wholesome. My grandpa, my dad, and I making three generations of wives worried sick. Oh, that's so beautiful. I love photos like this so much when each generation is doing the same thing. It's so bloody cute. And you could have easily not done this, but you were like, no, I have to stick to the tradition. The woman I'm planning to marry showed me this pebble that looks like a guitar pick and with an entirely straight face said, for rock music. Oh, wow, that's so beautiful. I hope they have a beautiful relationship together. Confession, I have a friend who likes to text me at like 4am when he's had nightmares or he can't sleep or he just needs a friend. He thinks I'm always awake at 4am but I really go to bed around 12 and I change his text tone to the loudest one I have just so it wakes me up when he needs me. You're the kind of friend that everybody needs. Yeah, that's so sweet. And on that note, thank you for watching everybody. I hope you had a wonderful time. And if you did and you want to see more episodes like this, make sure you like and subscribe. And the comment of the day goes to Star Rose 108 I took screenshots of some of these to send to my parents, especially the bear one. My mum loves memes about petting bears. Oh, that's so awesome. Like, not only is it so awesome that you guys watch my videos, but screenshotting memes out of the videos and sending them to people you love. That's so wholesome. And it's an honor. Thank you for the support. I'm so glad you like the stuff that I read and I'll be back tomorrow for more. Make sure you look after yourself and make sure you have a beautiful, amazing rest of your day. And you know what I'm about to say because I say it every single day. Bye!